Okay. So, are you ready, Jen? Everything's good. Yeah, ready. Okay. So, I mean, so it's good to be back. Summer is almost over. Uh, um, but we're still here, so it's good to have. <clears throat> it's very nice to have Jelle, who was giving a talk about uh, dynamics of fluids without boost symmetries. Let me just remind you that, as usual, everybody, is, please stay mute, and uh, whenever you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask uh, as many questions as you want. Yeah, in principle, the talk is about an, about one hour, but we are very flexible depending on how many questions we have. And okay. Please go ahead. Okay, Daniel, thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, thanks to the whole team for uh, allowing me to present this work here. Uh, it's a really great initiative, and I think it keeps the community alive in these difficult times, and I also hope everybody is doing well. Um, so, the work I would like to present is work that um, I've done Sorry, yeah, with. Just, Let me remind people that your slides are online and you, and you just have to go to his uh, to the webinar page and click on this. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, the work that I'll present today is work that uh, I've been doing for a number of years now. I think maybe it goes back, the first discussions I think go back maybe even four years. And this was together with uh, Jan de Boer. Uh, Emil Heve uh, as my PhD students, uh, Niels Obers and Batze Siebesma. And uh, that is as much as the most recent uh, paper is concerned, which is the one I'll talk about the most today. But I should also emphasize that we wrote two earlier papers together with Stefan van Doren, uh, and they have been very instrumental in order for us to do the work that uh, I'll ultimately like to, sh to sort of present today. So, um, yeah, so as you can see, it's about fluids without boost symmetries. So I'll start with the introduction, sort of explain to you uh, why we think that's an interesting subject. And since this is about, you know, it's a hollow tube at the end of my talk, I hope there is time. I will talk a little bit about actual holographic implementations uh, of uh, a specific class of fluids without boost symmetries, this is, which is well known, uh, and that are called Lipschitz fluids. All right. So if you open up, uh, do you see the slide moving? Because I, I don't see them happening. Yeah, you mean the pointer? Do you see the next slide? That's uh, no, 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 but for some reason. No. Yeah. That is a bit strange. Let me stop share and share again, hopefully. Okay, if that doesn't work, we can try making you host. Maybe that was the problem. <clears throat> Okay, now I think we see a different slide, still loading. Uh, and do you see now yet another one? Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's not. Okay, okay. Thanks. So if you open up, yeah, right. So if you open up a standard textbook like London Lipschitz on fluid dynamics, um, there is very heavy use in, in, in building up the actual final equations, like the navier Stokes equations. Um, by, by sort of going to a, there's a notion of rest frame and that plays a key role in, in almost any dynamics. Um, um, so like either it doesn't depend on the kind of boost symmetry because it's true if you have Galilean boosts or Lorentz boosts, there's always a notion of rest frame. And typically what you do is you go to the rest frame, uh, you define a diagonal, like for example, in the relativistic case, you define a diagonal stress tensor, you boost it up, uh, and then you make your functions local functions of space time, and then you add derivative corrections. So that's in a nutshell what, what people do. Now you want to understand uh, what's a fluid that doesn't have boost symmetry. So you have to confront the question, okay, now I don't have a rest frame anymore. Any fluid with a particular velocity, let, let's talk about global thermal equilibrium, so really at the level of thermodynamics, all of these systems are physically distinct. So you have to come up with a way to sort of um, invent some sort of path such that this whole notion of rest frame is sort of bypassed and you can still sort of define fluids. And that was initially a little bit part of the obstruction that we were confronted with. So I'll, I'll, I'll come with a resolution and an idea about how to do that. Well, let me first motivate uh, 
why uh, this kind of fluids are interesting in the first place. So often in, say, condensed matter type systems, translations are broken at a, at a very small scale. Um, but uh, what we'll assume here, and I will try to argue that this is possible to make this assumption, is that while translations may be broken at a very small scale, effectively, if you zoom out a little bit, they may become effectively sort of symmetries again, but they will then so sort of break the boosts. And so you can have systems uh, that have boost symmetry, that have broken boost symmetry, but they do not have broken, broken translations. And in order to describe a fluid, what you really need is energy and momentum conservation. So you need time translation invariance and you need space translation invariance. There is no need in principle, at least, for having boost symmetries. There's in fact also no need for having spatial rotation symmetries, but I'm going to assume that just for simplicity. So to give you an example here, um, you can think of a relativistic uh, system in an electromagnetic background, and then diffeomorphism invariance tells you that the divergence of the energy momentum tensor uh, is given by uh, a current J mu and is contracted with the Faraday tensor. And if I move things around a little bit and I decouple, so F mu nu is dA, and I move some things to the left and keep some things to the right, then I can rewrite that equation. And then on the, and on the, so that on the, and I'm using here that the current is conserved, then what I get is that the, the breaking of this, this new object, this one here, is controlled by, uh, if I turn on a background value for my, for this, I don't necessarily think this is a gauge field, it's just a vector or one form in my theory that doesn't break, trans, that doesn't break rotations, but it does break boosts because it points in the time direction. If this function lambda depends on space time, then uh, so this sort of new stress tensor is no longer conserved. So you see that, but when lambda becomes effectively constant, then this is conserved again. So then for, for small fluctuations of lambda, I have effectively restored translation symmetry, but I pay a price for it because this tensor I just underlined, which is written here again, so this new stress tensor is no longer symmetric in, in the interchanging the mu and new indices. So I have broken now Lorentz boosts. Uh, and so this is a system that doesn't have Lorentz boosts anymore, but it still has effectively uh, uh, translation invariance. Okay. So that's sort of a very simple idea of what, what I mean in general, that um, you can sort of break translations, and but then as you, as you zoom out, uh, you sort of re restore the translations effectively on large scales, but at the price that you don't have boosts. And also on the algebraic level, uh, you can understand this as follows. So you need to have time translations, otherwise you can't talk about boost symmetry. Uh, so if you, if, you, if, if, you, if, you, if you assume that you have time translations, but you break the translations, and because of this commutation relation here, this one, this is universally true, whether it's Lorentz or Galilei boost. So in both cases, you have the same commutation relation. If I break P, but I keep H, I must break B, right? That's a simple algebraic fact, but the converse is not true. So I can break the B, but it doesn't imply that I have to have to, I also have to break P, as we know, for example, from the Lipschitz algebra. So, so there can exist regimes in which we effectively recover translation invariance, but we don't have boost symmetry. And this includes cases uh, that people have studied quite a bit uh, in the half GH community that have uh, Lipschitz scale symmetry, because that's just the same system that on top of having the symmetries of time and space translations and spatial rotations has an additional symmetry namely scale invariance. And so, so that's like having a relativistic system that becomes conformal. So basically the Lipschitz plays the role of that sort of extra uh, symmetry that you add. And what I will do is that I will basically classify the hydrodynamics without assuming this Lipschitz scale symmetry because it doesn't buy you all that much it just reduces the number of transport coefficients at the end of the day. And so I will, I will let you know when I get there, how many uh, transport coefficients are removed as soon as you, you insist on, on scale symmetry. And I should also mention that uh, other people have uh, thought about these sort of things as well. So already back in 2013, there was work by Hoyos Kimenos, um, and also recently by uh, Novak, Sommer and Withers, 
uh, where they also include charge. So, so I will discuss mostly uh, first order derivative corrections to fluids that are not charged, but at the perfect fluid level, I will include the charge case. The reason we didn't include the charge is not because uh, it's not interesting, it's very interesting. It's just that um, it keeps, in, because we're gonna do things on a curved background for reasons I'll explain later, it keeps things somewhat technically under control. And once that you understand that sector, then you can add charge later as an additional layer of complication. Now, uh, another thing that we found a few years ago is that um, we made the following observation. Um, you could say, well, I have Lifshitz symmetries and they can have critical exponents Z being anything. But we know that on an algebraic level, that doesn't imply that there are no boosts because we know there are algebras, namely the Schrodinger algebras, that uh, add Galilean boosts to dilatations for any value of this critical exponent. But what we discovered was that if you, if you insist that the system has a well-defined thermodynamic description, that that's a non-trivial requirement and that uh, you cannot have boosts which in a thermodynamic system when the critical exponent is different from either one or two. And this is quite easy to derive. It's some kind of Nogol theorem. Uh, I will basically derive it a bit later on. Um, but the main reason for this is this, is this statement here that uh, the unitary irreducible representations of the associated group do not form a discrete spectrum when you place the system in finite volume. And this is a necessary condition in order for it to have a well-defined thermodynamics uh, des uh, description. And so uh, you can show that that doesn't happen. So it's a basically a representation for you of the Schrodinger algebras, uh, how, you, how you get a continuous spectrum for, for uh, the dilatation operator. And uh, a similar observation was made in this paper by Grinstein and Paul uh, in 2018 using purely field theoretic arguments. So they looked at correlation functions and showed that they are uh, uh, ill-behaved um, for these Schrodinger groups unless Z is one or two. So the Z is one case, of course, is relativistic hydro, and the Z is two case is uh, Galilean uh, hydro. You can generalize this no-go result even to systems that have uh, hyperscaling violation exponents, uh, theta, and uh, this so-called charge anomalous dimension uh, that I call alpha. And then the no-go theorem says that unless uh, Z takes this value or this value, uh, you can't have any boost symmetries. So that makes it also, from that point of view, if you believe that systems of Lipschitz symmetries are relevant and that they can be thermodynamic, then you must understand uh, hydrodynamics for systems that don't have any boost symmetries for the, because of this simple no-go theorem. All right. Now, if you're breaking boost, in some sense, what that means is that you have a medium that interacts non-trivially with that fluid. And so you can ask the question, what is that medium? For example, in the case of a Lipschitz invariant system. And uh, I don't want to give you a universal answer because I don't have a universal answer. I don't know if there is a universal answer, but I just want to give you sort of an idea of the kind of thing that can happen, for example. Uh, so this is really interesting paper by Watanabe and Murayama, where they essentially look at a, a system of a domain wall that separates two different superfluids. So the domain wall is, uh, has two spatial dimensions, and then they're interested in the fluctuations of that domain wall uh, as it sort of moves between these two superfluids, and the fluctuation of the domain wall is described by this, this field phi. And when the, when the domain wall moves a little bit, it excites a gapless mode in the superfluid. Now, you can integrate that out. Of course, integrating out gapless modes typically leads to non-local theories, and that's exactly what happens. So that's why you have, this is a non-local theory because of this kinetic term here. It's the kinetic term that becomes non-local. And, and this is a, you can just do the dimension counting. And this is a, a system that has a scaling dimension Z is three half. So this is a system with fractional, uh, fractional um, critical exponent. And what I like about this is that, uh, what it sort of suggests is that uh, non-local systems maybe are the way to think about these sort of th theories. So when Z is integer, uh, you could think that there are a number of Goldstone modes of some broken uh, phase. But when Z is not integer, it's most likely some kind of non-local theory. And here's an example. 
So in this case, the question is, what's the medium? Well, the medium is obviously these, these sort of uh, superfluid capless modes that, that make the, that, that sort of create the, the, the background that breaks the boost symmetry in some sense. So I think that this is a very interesting uh, class of models. And um, I, I, I think it would be interesting for, for example, from a purely field theoretic point of view to, to sort of try to understand them in some sort of more general sense uh, to, to describe lift shift systems with uh, non integer values of that. I don't think that has been explored much uh, so far. So, okay, so that's the end of my introduction. So if you have a question about that, uh, please do ask. Um, all right, so, uh, so the outline of my talk is that uh, I'll begin with the basics. Uh, so just describe the thermodynamics for systems that don't have any boost symmetry. And then moving on to perfect fluids, I will put them on a curved background. This curved background cannot be your ordinary geometry that you encounter in general relativity because uh, we don't have any uh, Lorentz symmetry in the game. So we call that absolute space, or some people call it Aristotelian geometry. Uh, it's a bit of an esoteric name, but I'll explain what it is. It's, not, it's really not that complicated. And once we've established that, I will introduce uh, the standard entropy current formalism, and then basically run the program of deriving all the transport coefficients, uh, which for this type of systems is quite a bit of work. And hopefully towards the end, I'll have some time to say a few things about the, uh, the holographic realization, which is still very much in its infancy, but uh, at least at the perfect fluid level, we, we know more or less how that works. All right, so that's the, the plan for today. So uh, we'll study this in the grand canonical ensemble. Um, and what you have to do now is that, uh, in, 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 in fact, this, what I'm gonna say here is also true for, for Lorentz invariant systems or Galilean invariant systems is that it's just that often you do it in the rest frame. So you wouldn't think of it this way, but it would still be a correct description. So what we do here is that we have your, this is a Hamiltonian operator. We might have some uh, particle number or some charge. And now we also have conserved momenta. So remember we have space translation invariant. So there are conserved momenta operators. And for each of them, we introduce a um, chemical potential. And in the case of momenta, the chemical potential is essentially the velocity. So we treat velocity as a chemical potential to describe systems in different inertial frames. So uh, we now think of uh, the, the grand potential, which is just the logarithm of this partition function, as depending on temperature, uh, volume, volume we're going to deal with by using extensivity, uh, the usual arguments. And then uh, this extra dependence here is really the crucial new ingredient. And you can then derive uh, using completely textbook standard thermodynamics that uh, the first law would basically be a, a statement like this. And that the variation with respect to the velocity gives you the uh, ensemble average momentum. And that's where the momentum then, and that, that's how you think of momentum in, in this sort of systems. And this also works for, um, for relativistic systems or, or Galilean systems. So, I'm not in that sense doing anything unusual. It's just that it generalizes also to cases when you don't have full symmetry. So then you can, uh, from the grand potential and uh, using extensivity that uh, you can divide by the volume, you basically sorry, get minus. Sorry, can, I, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Is there any restriction on the values the velocities can take? No, not, no, not at all. Okay. Um, there will be a restriction in some sense uh, for momenta because um, because of the rotational symmetry, there's only one vector in the game. That means that these vectors must be proportional to each other. And that's something I'm going to use uh, maybe on the next slide already. But that's really forced by uh, rotational variance. But the velocity can take any value. So there's no, no restriction on velocity. Thank you. So if you now do a, a Legendre transformation of pressure and you go to your energy density, so now you're looking for something that only depends on extensive quantities, then you get this expression here at the top. And then the first law, it just uh, becomes this expression. And so uh, this is the thing I was just saying. So then what we do now is that we make the observation that uh, because we have SOD 
rotational symmetry, so little d is the number of spatial dimensions. Uh, and also know that I've now moved from, uh, I've, I'm now working with densities because I want to do fluids, so I'm going to do everything in terms of densities. This is a momentum density, and so by rotational symmetry, it must be proportional to the only vector that I have in my theory, which is v. And so the proportionality constant we call rho is what we is, is, must have dimensions of mass by dimensional counting. And uh, so this is what we call the mass density. In fact, we call it kinetic mass density. So in the Galilean theory, this would just be the thing that you call mass in Newton's law. But uh, of course, um, in a the relativistic theory, there would be a gamma factor. And in general, it is a really completely arbitrary function. You just don't know. So the new thing in a non-boost invariant world is that you have to say what rho is. And so your equation of state has to uh, include the information about what rho is. So um, if the equation of state is a statement about pressure, you can think of pressure as a function of the intensive variables. And then if you know what that function is, in principle, then this give down relation will by then differentiate the pressure as with respect to the velocity, I can compute what rho is. So it's, it's now in, in, encoded in the equation of state. So the equation of state, instead of being a function of just t and mu in a non boost invariant setting, it's a function of t, mu, and v squared. It can only depend on v squared because of rotational symmetry. So it's only the magnitude really that plays a role. So as soon as I fix boost symmetry, being it either Galilean or Lorentz, then that will fix for me rho, because normally rho is not a quantity that, uh, that you can play with. So it's fixed by, by sort of water densities for boost symmetry. So for example, in the, and I will show you later why this is, but for a Galilean boost, then rho becomes uh, the mass density or the particle number density. And then uh, if you substitute that in this gibbs down relation, you can rewrite it in this way. So you see I have included, so rho and n are now the same thing, so I can move, include v hat here in mu, define a mu, uh, a new mu called mu hat, and then p only depends on t and mu hat and no longer explicitly depends on v squared. So, which is a manifestation of the fact of boost symmetry. So I've got, effectively gone to a rest frame now where all the v dependence has sort of disappeared. Um, can I ask you something, uh, Jelle? I mean, yeah. is, uh, my question is related to cars. So what if you want to normalize that velocity, for example? Is it meaningful or you are not allowed to do that? You want to normalize v squared? Yeah, for example. Um, I mean, are, are you allowed to do that or? Um, no, not really, because then you would break uh, well, I mean, each value of v squared is, it's, you think of v squared as a chemical potential. So, I mean, it's basically data that you have to feed the system, um, but it's unconstrained. I mean, v squared is any positive number. Okay, thanks. Later when we use a covariant, uh, so this v is sort of, a, a sort of a, the free velocity, if you like, uh, Later, when we use a covariant language, we'll talk about u mu. That does have a, a normalization because I normalize the time direction. It's a bit like saying u squared equals minus one in a relativistic theory. Okay, so earlier on, I mentioned that there is a no-go theorem uh, that says that as soon as you have Lipschitz scaling, uh, and here I also include a hyperscaling violation exponent, and I include some uh, charge and numbers dimension, um, that this can sometimes clash with having a certain kinds of boost symmetry and that this is really easy to understand. So if you, if you take this Gibbs down relation here and uh, I just input in there uh, this transformations on the scaling, so lambda is just a constant parameter under which pressure scales, temperature scales, then that sort of defines these sort of the, the, the temperature would define, uh, for example, your dynamical critical exponent, etc., uh, And then you can read off from the gibbs down relation, you can read off what dimensions are of uh, the, the particle number density and, and the mass density. And you see that in general, they're not, they're not the same. But if the system has Galilean invariance, then rho and n must be equal to each other. And then you can just read off a simple equality here that that will be only the case 
if uh, Z is alpha plus two. And if, for example, if there's no charge known as dimension, then Z must be two. Even though there do exist algebras like the Schrodinger algebra that generalize for any value of Z, you see here that from a purely thermodynamic point of view, that doesn't work. So only Z is two is compatible with boost symmetries. Okay, so that's this no-go theorem that as, as soon as you measure a critical exponent different from one or two, um, then uh, there, there cannot be any boost. So that was thermodynamics. So now let's make the next step. So now we want to go from global thermal equilibrium to local thermal equilibrium, in other words, perfect fluids. And so we have to then start talking about the currents. And so um, since the system has time and space translation symmetry, we assume that there are noted currents. Uh, so one noted current is the energy current. So that's the, the, the current that has the index zero downstairs. And there is a momentum current that is the one that has a spatial index downstairs. And you have to specify what they are. And in principle, there can also be a charge current that I call J. Now, if you only guide yourself by symmetries, so you would say, okay, I have a time and space translation symmetries that's been dealt with. I have these currents and they must be conserved. So there cannot be any explicit space and time dependence that always has to be implicit by the way these uh, currents depend on the fluid variables. But now you also have rotational symmetries, but that's, uh, that's everything you've got. So now you can ask, what is the most general set of currents, uh, the components of them, when I impose SOD rotational symmetry? And the answer is, it's more general than what I wrote down here. But now thermodynamics kicks in again, and that sort of allows you to reduce uh, the energy momentum tensor a little bit, because in thermodynamics, you could say there's a slogan that says, charges have to flow with the velocity VI. So what that means is, for example, for the charge, that's absolutely obvious. If, uh, you know, conservation essentially means that my charge, the flux has to be N times V, and it has to be N here and not something else, not some N tilde. It has to really be that same N that I have here. Similarly, I have a momentum flux and I must have some sort of energy flux. So that reduces it down to uh, E, P, uh, rho and n, and then uh, there is a relation between E and P, rho and n, so I have three, uh, three undetermined functions there that all are provided once I know what the equation of state is. So this is what we do. So this is a definition of a perfect fluid, and you could say, well, you know, you, you sort of argued it, but you didn't really prove it. And later on, I can derive this from some sort of hydrostatic partition function approach. So we have many arguments that lead to the same final answer. Uh, but this, I think, is the most intuitive one. And then the equations of motion are simply just uh, conservation equations for the fluids. And if I want to go back to familiar systems with Lorentz or Galilei boost symmetry, I have to impose the appropriate water densities. So for the Lorentz, uh, the water density is this one here. And for a Galilei boost, the water density is that momentum is the same as the mass flux or the particle number current. And that's actually the reason, this is something you can prove quite vigorously using all sorts of um, general arguments about field theories. Uh, and this here is what, what, what tells you that uh, rho and n have to be the same. Okay, so that's, that's a, a, a non-boost invariant perfect fluid. So now I want to generalize this. So this is on flat space and uh, I wanna now put this on a curved space not because I'm, I'm, I'm ultimately interested in curved space, but because that doing so is a technique that uh, is, well, I guess many of you know this, uh, allows you to compute many other things as well. So for example, if you, if you put things on a curved background, you can use this hydrostatic partition function approach as well as its generalizations. I'll explain that in more detail later. You can derive things like Kubo formulas for two point functions between so if I know the energy momentum tensor on an arbitrary curved background, I can vary the energy momentum tensor with my geometry with respect to the, what, what sort of replaces the notion of metric. And then I can compute two point functions, for example. And they also uh, help us sort of the, the diffeomorphism covariance helps enormously in sort of writing down the general structure of the derivative expansion and counting all the transport coefficients and all that sort of stuff. So those are the, the, the main motivations for putting this on a curved background. Now, uh, there are other reasons as well, by the way, uh, for wanting to put this on a curved background. If, for example, you're interested in alternative theories of gravity, like, for example, Lipschitz gravity, which can be very useful for holographic purposes, uh, 
because maybe they are the bulk dual of some non relativistic field theory. And then this Horshava Lipschitz gravity is actually the dynamics of the kind of background on which I'm putting these fluids. Because also in Horshava Lipschitz gravity, you give up local Lorentz symmetry. It was sort of initially, Horshava Lipschitz gravity started out as a theory with reduced diffeomorphism invariance. But you can reformulate that as saying that you have full diffeo invariance, but you don't have full local Lorentz invariance. And so you're changing the tangent space structure of the theory. And the way that that manifests itself is that these space times have a different metric structure than you would, uh, than you're familiar with from general relativity. So, so in general relativity, you would just have a, a metric uh, G mu nu uh, with a Lorentzian signature. So it would be something like minus one, plus one, et cetera. What we're gonna do now is that we're gonna, in some sense, write this as minus tau mu tau nu plus something purely spatial, h mu nu. And this, this one form tau is what we call the clock one form. And the integrals of this along any curve tell me what the time difference is between these two events. And this spatial metric, which is the one here, is, is something that has signature 0, 1, 1, 1. So uh, it has one zero eigenvalue, and uh, we'll come to that uh, in the next slide. So essentially what we're now gonna do is that instead of forcing tau and h to always sit in this specific combination uh, that I wrote here, I'm gonna set them free. So I'm no longer insisting because this here has uh, local Lorentz symmetry, but I, I don't need local Lorentz symmetry. So um, I now have two metrics in the game a one four metric and a, a two four metric with a somewhat odd signature. And that structure uh, is what we call Aristotelian geometry or absolute space. Uh, absolute space in the sense that there, um, there are no, there, there, there are no um, equivalence principles in some sense. So there is, no, there is nothing like Einstein's equivalence principle or Galilei's equivalence principle here. So that's in a nutshell what I mean by uh, the kind of geometry in which we're going to put these fluids. Uh, so just to be a little bit more um, specific here, so because the signature of this spatial metric h mu nu is a 0, 1, 1, 1, I can use some kind of field by decomposition uh, where this metric here is basically uh, the part of the signature that counts all the ones. And, and these guys are my spatial field binds. But beware here that these are not square matrices because mu runs over all space-time directions. So they're d plus one space-time directions, whereas little a only runs from one to d, only counts the spatial directions. So they, these are not square view bonds. You can't, you can't do the obvious thing of just inverting them. But what is a square matrix is the matrix uh, when, when I just attach tau to it as well. So I have another row or column, depending on how you put it. Uh, and I add tau. Tau is in some sense your E0. You can think of this as, as E0. And then uh, this is invertible. And then the inverse of that matrix is uh, defined by the what we call the inverse. So this is a velocity vector. This is sort of orthonormal to the clock form. By orthonormal, I mean these two equations. Sorry these two equations. And then I have a spatial inverse wheel bind, which is this one, uh, which is orthogonal to the clock one form, and uh, it forms this uh, orthonormal system here. So these are my basic building blocks. And if I write down uh, a theory on, on such a background, then they have to, the, the fields in the theory have to couple to this sort of geometric data. And I just have to make sure that everything I write down is SOD invariant. That's all that I have to worry about. Now you could wonder, you know, what sort of the next layer of structure here you can add, you can, you can start worrying about, is there something like a Levi-Civita connection? But, um, and if the answer is that you can define all of these things, but we're not actually gonna be needing them because it turns out that if you restrict yourself to first order corrections, uh, you can write everything in terms of D derivatives and D derivatives don't need uh, things like Levi-Civita connections. So, it would be necessary if you go to the second order. So then you have things like Riemann curvature tensors, then you really need to know what the connection is, but uh, we're not gonna do that. So 
now that we have, we know what the perfect fluid is on flat space, we know what curved space is, so the obvious question is, so what, what does this perfect fluid become on a curved space? And this is the point where I, I, I stop including uh, a charge current. So I'm no longer, so from now on, everything sorry, will be charged. Sorry, I have another question. Can I, so, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. About, please, uh, about this uh, uh, derivative. So I vaguely remember that when you, when you do this, when you introduce this, uh, say, a metric compatible connection, then mm -hmm. when in the space times, I think they always have torsion. Isn't that right? That's correct, yeah. So now you have a torsion tensor. A torsion tensor is uh, sort of first order in derivative on your, on your metric field, so to speak. Yes. But it's a covariant object. It's not like a connection. A connection isn't a physical yeah. object, right? It doesn't transform like a tensor, but the torsion yeah. tensor is a tensor. Yeah. So when you do that, in principle, this first derivative tensor first order derivative tensor could appear in the constitutive, uh, uh, constitutive relations at first order in derivatives. Completely correct, yeah. So, and, and so you're wondering why are you not including that? So I am including that because it turns out that that torsion can be written as the leader derivative of my clock one form. Yeah, okay, very good, thanks. Okay, but that's an absolutely valid point, yeah. We call that intrinsic torsion actually. Um, so it's, it's the, the, the fact that the reason you have torsion is because metric compatibility, if, if, so if I have some kind of covariant derivative, uh, now by mu, and I want this to be, I want this to be zero, then this forces the connection to have torsion by, by just taking, looking at the anti-symmetric part of this equation. Um, but, uh, that basically relates the anti-symmetric part of this one to uh, something like d tau in form notation. Um, and then I can essentially rewrite it in terms of the derivative. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so I'm gonna now, from now on for simplicity really, not, uh, but it would be really interesting to generalize this to include charge. Um, uh, sort of I'm gonna drop uh, having a, a charge current. So to make things a little bit easier. Um, so, the energy momentum tensor, uh, we, it, it's actually really useful to think of it as a one comma one tensor. Um, because it's really the, so this is the current index and this is the index that tells you which particular current you're looking at. Is the energy current or one of the momentum currents. And I will decompose that using my metric data in this way. So I have this T mu and this one here, T mu rho, and I'll give them different names. Um, this one I'm gonna call the energy currents and T mu nu I'll call the momentum stress tensor. So for a perfect fluid, that's just pressure plus my um, momentum uh, flux uh, and the, the energy current is essentially the, the, the energy flow, the flow of energy. And I have now introduced uh, a covariant velocity, which is essentially the same thing as a u mu in the relativistic setting, except that uh, my normalization is slightly different. I say it's, um, it's normalized with respect to the clock one form such that this is the case. It's an arbitrary choice of normalization, but it's, it's, it's a convenient way of doing things. So that essentially means that on flat space, uh, u mu is just one, and then the vector v, okay? So that's how you can think of it. And this vector v is completely unconstrained. Sorry, now, again, it's, it's again me, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I will stop it sometime, <laughs> but okay. So here conceptually, I have a slight problem and it's the following. Um, a chemical potential and you introduce the velocities as chemical potentials, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So these are objects, chemical potentials are defined only if you're in at equilibrium, very near equilibrium or anything like this, right? So like yes. temperature, temperature is not defined per se, it's only defined if you're close to equilibrium. <laughs> also, you okay. want chemical potential is only defined if you're close to equilibrium or at equilibrium, then it's really well defined. Yeah. And in a similar sense, I would think here that the velocities that you introduced in the very beginning can only be defined if you are sufficiently close or at equilibrium in your Lifshitz theory, right? Mm -hmm. However, now you have introduced a completely independent structure, which is the geometry, right? Mm 
And this mm -hmm. geometry is defined completely independent of the state of the theory. It's like saying, you mm -hmm. know, the metric in which my theory lives is completely independent of the state in which the theory is. Of course, then, mm -hmm. you know, if you're near equilibrium, you can play games like the famous Luttinger formula, where you trade gradients for temperature with gradients in the gravitational field and things like that. And this allows you to derive cool formulas. But a priori, these are conceptually completely different things. I completely agree with that. And I'm going to a sort of impose a condition. Oh, sorry, okay. this is my cat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to impose a condition on the geometry uh, that, that sort of um, is the same as saying that there's a time like killing factor in the background so that I can talk about slowly varying. And I'm going to define that, I'm going to use that time like killing factor to define velocity and temperature, just like you do in the sort of hydrostatic partition function approach in the relativistic mm -hmm. case. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm not going to put this fluid now on a completely generic. Well, okay, yeah. Well, you could still you can still move away from that. Uh, so because that sort of is a global equilibrium system, and I can still sort of imagine that on a completely generic background geometry, uh, there is a regime in which uh, I am close to some sort of thermal equilibrium, and it's still a good description. I think that that. That also works in the relativistic case, as far as I'm. Yeah, yeah, aware. I understand that. So when you're saying that, similar. Sorry, so I, I, I not so similar from the relativistic case. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, I probably should stop and go on with you. Oh, it's good to ask questions. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. But thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, so. A very important thing that we need now uh, next is sort of the notion of uh, conservation. So you know that in the uh, in the relativistic uh, setting, uh, this is the uh, the famous statement of conservation of energy momentum. And so, what's the analog in this Aristotelian uh, space time? And my claim is, and I'm just I'm not deriving this, but I mean my claim is that it's this equation here. I can derive it if you give me an action. Uh, I can vary all the, the, the geometric data and I can define the response to varying tau and the response to varying h mu nu. And, and, the, and this is the response to varying tau, this is the response to varying h mu nu. And then I can choose that variation to be a diffeomorphism and then I get this uh, equation. This is also why I call it the diffeomorphism border density. So if given an action, uh, you can derive this. For fluids, of course, it's not always obvious you can write down an action, and I'll just postulate that this is the sort of correct equation. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do now, and this, 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 this may look a little bit unfamiliar, but I'm just going to, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation that I just highlighted here, and I'm going to put in there uh, these expressions for um, the energy current and for the momentum stress tensor. And I'm going to rewrite that quite a bit. Uh, and then uh, I hope you believe me that you can actually rewrite it such that it takes this particular form here. And you might think that, oh, that's a peculiar way of writing that equation. But it turns out that this is going to help enormously uh, later on uh, when we're going to do the derivative expansion. And the reason is that the derivative expansion is an on-shell expansion. So at some point, I have to say which derivatives I'm going to solve in favor of which other derivatives. And it, so these derivatives, so these, what I write here are Lie derivatives of tau along beta, where beta is basically the, uh, it contains all the fluid variables. So it has the, the, the normalized velocity mu and the magnitude of beta tells me something about temperature, the local temperature. And so that's on the left-hand side, I have the lead derivative of beta of tau, and on the right-hand side, I have a similar object of, of h mu nu. But it has a few corrections here. These corrections are not arbitrary. They conspire such that uh, if I rescale beta, then the whole thing scales homogeneously. So this is a very nice sort of, so what that means in practice is that uh, these are really velocity derivatives, and these are temperature derivatives, essentially. So. Since this one scales homogeneously as I scale beta, I can also think of this as the derivatives along u only and not just beta. So, and so that's what I mean here is that the lead derivatives along beta of the matrix 
can be viewed as derivatives of the fluid variables by just rewriting them a little bit. So what I'm doing here is I'm trading all the temperature derivatives in favor of derivatives of the velocity field. That's, that's really what that, what that means. And that's, so in flat space, uh, that's what I wrote here. On flat space, this relates temperature derivatives to the velocity derivatives. So this is like the acceleration and this is uh, the, the shear or something. So when I'm gonna do the on child derivative expansion, I'm always going to substitute these types of derivatives in favor of these types of derivatives. That's, that's essentially the idea. This is the covariance incarnation of that idea. So in order for this to be a fluid, uh, as you well know, is uh, I need to have an entropy current and that entropy current better have the property that uh, uh, it obeys locally the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, that manifests itself by the requirement that whatever that current is, its divergence should be non-negative. And there is a, a standard theory for dealing with the entropy currents. And, and that theory tells us that uh, we should split this into what's called a canonical part and a non-canonical part. So the canonical part is the part of the entropy current that is canonically defined, meaning it is defined in terms of the objects that are canonically given once you talk about a fluid. And what are those objects? Those are the currents that are conserved. So the stress tensor uh, and the fluid variables as well as the equation of state. So canonically given to me when I talk about a fluid is the fact that I have some energy momentum tensor T mu nu, I have some fluid variables that I can put in a vector called beta, and I have some equation of state for the pressure. And then you define this particular uh, combination, and, and this combination is defined such that it has the following property that if I take out, if I project it along time, that this is exactly the, en the entropy density. So, so that sort of fixes the relative coefficients here. But of course, the entropy currents doesn't need to be precisely that. Uh, it, it should be the most general object that we can build out of the fluid variables. And so to account for that, we include this so-called non-canonical part, which is really the most general uh, vector that you can think of in terms of constitutive relations uh, that are built out of derivatives of the fluid variables. But it's still a very useful way to split things up like this uh, for reasons that uh, will become clear as we go along. So now you, what you can do is you can, uh, you can compute the divergence of, so, so since you know the canonical part, because of this expression here, you can take the divergence and you can compute at, at least that part of the divergence, you compute it compute explicitly, and you get a very, very useful result, which is this equation here. Namely that, the divergence of the total entropy current, it has, of course, a non-canonical piece about where we currently know nothing. And then it has these two other pieces, which you, in order to compute that, all you need to use are uh, the perfect fluid equations of motion, uh, because this zero here means zero order in derivatives, but that's really the perfect fluid part. And you use things like the uh, first, first uh, law of thermodynamics. So, I copy this equation on the next slide. So at the top, they repeated the equation. And so what, what, what is so useful here is that, uh, first of all, it tells you that if I am just dealing with a perfect fluid, then T equals to T zero, and then these terms are zero. And then um, you can argue that there's never a, canonical, a non canonical entropy current for a perfect fluid, and then my entropy current is conserved as you expect uh, for a perfect fluid. So the non-canonical entropy current only kicks in once you start talking about derivative corrections. And the, the game now is that we are gonna split these, uh, the, the difference of T and T zero, which are now, so the right-hand side is at least one derivative in three parts. And we're gonna do that for the energy current and for the, uh, for the uh, momentum stress currents. And one is the dissipative part and the dissipative part is such that it makes a non-negative or it makes a positive contribution to entropy production. So that means that this contribution to the equation here at the top is always positive and it's only zero if the currents themselves are zero. So it's the, uh, so in some sense, positive definite, okay? So that's what we mean by dissipation. Um, so, Later, when we're going to introduce constitutive relations, we're going to write these, uh, these first order derivative corrections in terms of derivatives of the fluid variables. So you think of 
t as some derivatives of the fluid variables, and you see that they're multiplied by other derivatives of the fluid variables. So this is second order in derivatives. And so on the space of derivatives, which I can think of as some sort of vector space, this constitutes a quadratic form. And that quadratic form, I can ask, is it positive definite? Is it semi-positive definite, negative definite? And so for the dissipative part, that quadratic form has to be positive definite. So all the eigenvalues have to be positive. For the non-dissipative part, then that means that by definition, the, um, the divergence of the entropy current is zero. And there, there are essentially two ways. Uh, I can subdivide these two cases further, but essentially there are two, two uh, broad classes in which uh, you can do that. And one is to say, well, um, I'm going to let, let, let me assume that uh, for this class, the, there is no non-canonical entropy current. And then uh, it's defined in this way that uh, it exactly cancels. So, so the contribution to the right-hand side of the divergence of the entropy current gives me identically zero. And we call that, uh, for, for reasons that hopefully become clear, non-hydrostatic. Whereas the other sector, the hydrostatic sector, is also non dissipative and it's exactly designed to cancel against, so there's a, there's a conspiracy between this term and these two terms. And that's what's written here. So they cancel out exactly against each other. So these are the two types of non dissipative transport that we're going to classify. So the name of the game that we now have to do is we have to, for each of these three cases, we study them separately because they really they don't overlap. We study them separately and we have to, for each of them, we have to count how many transport coefficients are there uh, for, for such a, for such a non-boosting variant fluid. Okay, so I, hope, I hope that's clear because this sets the stage essentially for the, for the main part of the analysis. So we're gonna start in some sense with the most difficult of these three, which is the hydrostatic sector. Um, and what we're gonna use here is the, the hydrostatic partition function that was introduced uh, in, this, in this paper here. And essentially what we're gonna assume is that we have some weakly curved background with a time-like translation symmetry that's generated by uh, the Hamiltonian and that is an associated killing factor we're gonna call beta. It's the same beta that I had before. So the analog of the killing equations that you know from general relativity is that the lead derivative of the, of the metric objects have to vanish. And so in this case, uh, we have two metric objects, a clock form and a spatial metric, and they both have to be annihilated by the lead derivative along beta. So this is what it means on a curved background to have global thermal equilibrium. So if you were to work out these equations on flat space, it would tell you that temperature has to be constant, for example, and the velocity has to be constant. So what we're gonna do now is that um, we're gonna compute uh, the, the hydrostatic partition function, by which I really mean you take your grand canonical partition function, you, 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 you take the log and you do some sort of saddle point approximation, and then you write that out in some sort of derivative uh, expansion. So N here counts number of derivatives. And then you do some effective field theory. You basically ask yourself how many terms can I write down at zero of order derivatives? How many terms can I write down at first order derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna give them arbitrary names. Uh, so of course at first order derivatives, uh, there's only one thing I can write down. It's of course the, the pressure. And it can now depend on two, on two quantities, the temperature and uh, the velocity squared. But at, um, at first order derivatives, I have to count modulo these sort of conditions here. So I need to be careful that I don't write derivatives that are actually equivalent to the derivatives I already wrote here by use of those equations. So if you work out that analysis, uh, you, it turns out there are two independent derivative corrections, which is this one, this one. So I remind you that V mu is essentially the inverse time-like field line. So this is essentially a, a time derivative of temperature and a time derivative of uh, the velocity squared. So uh, we claim that at first order derivatives, this is the most general hydrostatic partition function. So what you do now is that uh, in order to now compute the energy momentum tensor, of course, I cannot just vary that object because 
there is a constraint, namely that beta has to be a time like killing vector. So what we're going to do next, and this is also explained in this uh, sort of the eightfold way paper, is you're going to you're going to drop the condition that beta is a. Um, did you? I don't think the slide switched. Um, are you still looking at a slide that has uh, an action at the bottom? Yes. Okay, so then uh, somehow, I'm uh, sorry, I probably have to just do the same thing again. That I yeah, just, maybe try that. Because yeah. sometimes what we don't see is your pointer moving. Ah, okay. Okay. Sorry about this. Uh, okay, I think that's, yeah, so this was the last slide that I showed you, and, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to drop the condition that beta is a killing factor in order to be able to vary uh, the metric data uh, without uh, having to worry about that there was this constraint. So in some sense now moving away from the hydrostatic partition function, um, and what we're going to define now is that the variation with respect to, uh, I mentioned this before, is that the variation with respect to the metric data defines my energy current here, and I have my uh, ma momentum stress tensor here, which is the variation with respect to H. And of course, now beta is also arbitrary, so I can also vary beta. But uh, as is explained in this paper, um, it's not really an action principle in the usual sense because we do not view beta as a fundamental variable. Uh, so I don't want to get into that discussion, but technically what it means is that you're only allowed to vary beta on the diffeomorphisms. So it, it is as if beta is a function of more fundamental variables and that the variation of those variables always appear as if beta is varied under a diffeo. That's essentially the idea. And if you do that, then of course you get back this diffeo award entity. Uh, for the uh, for the energy momentum tensor, which we can now compute for this hydrostatic sector by just varying uh, the hydrostatic uh, action with respect to the um, uh, the metric data. Okay. So um, if you do that, it turns out that uh, you do not end up in Landau frame, which is the frame in which we would like to do the counting. So you have to then change the frame. Uh, that's a bit of a technical uh, nuisance, you could say, but you can do that. It's not, uh, it, we did it in paper, it's in an appendix. And the answer is, uh, is, is written here. So you have, um, so you see that these derivatives that I mentioned when I talked about the perfect fluid equations on the curved background, they appear here again. Uh, and there's also this rotation here. And then we have these eta tensors, which are essentially uh, like viscosity tensors. They have four indices. Uh, and, and so all the in important information is encoded inside the expression for these eta tensors. But these are quite lengthy expressions and they decompose according to the different uh, irreducible tensors in the theory, which are just these guys. And then for each of the irreducible tensor structures that you can write down, you have a specific coefficient um, and it turns out that for the hydrostatic uh, sector, uh, all these coefficients are functions of only two of only two functions, which are the two functions uh, that appeared uh, in the hydrostatic partition function, namely F1 and F2. So the two transport coefficients in that sector, because I only had two functions to begin with. Now, I said that uh, hydro is this hydrostatic sector was intimately related with the presence of a non-canonical entropy current. And that was not at all obvious from the analysis, but you can check that uh, indeed this is the case. So that uh, if you were, so you now know what uh, the right-hand side here is. So you have this object and the definition of the hydrostatic sector is this equation here written in Londo frame. And you can now work your way from right to left, and you can indeed uh, conclude that there is a solution, namely, and it's given by this equation here, up to identically conserved currents. So up to identically conserved currents from this analysis, I can now read off what the non-canonical entropy current should have been. 
And then you can say, well, but you assume that there was an action. Maybe there is also contributions to this non-canonical entropy current that do not come from an action. But then we did an independent calculation where we just said, okay, let's just write down constitutive relations for the non-canonical entropy current and impose this equation here, which is the definition for hydrostatic sector. And it turns out that there are only two uh, sort of coefficients that survive from that analysis, and they can be mapped one to one uh, with uh, the coefficients that appeared in that higher static partition function. So it turns out that these are the first order derivatives. Uh, this particular sector of the of the of the, the theory is completely described by the hydrostatic partition function. And now you can ask well, what happens if I go to a Lipschitz uh, theory, so I impose scale invariance, and then uh, you go from two functions to one function. So when you have Lipschitz uh, scale symmetry, this particular combination we call alpha. Uh, is scale invariant. So this power of temperature and P squared, this is a scale invariant combination. And then I can have any function of that scale invariant combination and derivatives thereof. So in the Lipschitz case, the hydrostatic sector has only one uh, transport coefficient. Now you can, um, there's another, as I mentioned, there's another non-dissipative sector, which you call the non-hydrostatic partition function. And for that, you can also write down an action. And essentially, uh, these are all the terms that before you were, uh, you, you were forced to drop because of this condition that beta is killing. When you drop the condition that beta is killing, you can actually, uh, you can show that there are four additional derivative structures that now become independent of each other. And these are written uh, here. Um, I'm, I'm going a little bit faster because I want to say something about the dissipative sector and then I think I need to wrap up. So, but you can, you, you can then compute for this particular action, you compute the energy momentum tensor and you can uh, explicitly verify that it obeys the definition of the non-hydrostatic sector, which is this equation here. So it doesn't contribute to entropy. Uh, this, this definition here is something that you may have probably seen before in the form of Onsager relations. So if you were to linearize the theory, then um, and you impose Onsager relations, then um, what it means is it kills the anti-symmetric part of the uh, of the um, tensor that 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 captures the, um, the the constitutive relation for for the energy momentum tensor. So if you were to write that as a matrix, then this would be an anti-symmetric matrix and the Onsager relations would tell you to set that to zero. And this is sort of the nonlinear version of that. So if you don't want this kind of uh, transport, then you have to kill all the non-hydrostatic terms. And there, and there are four of them, as you can see, because they have four, four functions. So there are four uh, transport coefficients in this particular sector, and there were two non dissipative transport coefficients in the hydrostatic sector. So this is in strong contrast with relativistic or Galilean invariant systems because at first order in derivatives, in those cases, you don't have any of this kind of structure because everything is purely dissipative. So you get a lot more uh, structure in these sort of non-boost invariant fluids. So as a last thing, uh, and sorry for going slightly over time, uh, I, I'm afraid I will have to drop the holographic uh, part of the story. But as a last thing, I want to say something about the, uh, the, the dissipative sector. So in order to, uh, to do that, it's, I can rewrite my divergence of the entropy current, which I wrote here, by sort of after I, because now we, have, we, we fully understand the non-canonical entropy current, so I can sort of plug it in there already. And so um, the, which I have done here by subtracting off this hydrostatic part. So basically, I've rewritten the derivative of the non-canonical piece in terms of um, by using what I used is this relation here, this one. So if I plug that into the general formula for the divergence of the entropy current, then um, I get this expression here at the top. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, basically use constitutive relations for this difference um, between the energy momentum tensor at first order derivative where I subtract off the hydrostatic sector. And so in order for this to be non-negative, I can already conclude without using constitutive relations that it must, it must uh, have this same derivative that I had here, 
of this derivative here must be appear in constitutive relation. Because if I wrote down any other derivative, I could never ever create a quadratic form that would be positive and that would be non-negative. So, and then all I'm left to do now is classify all the allowed terms inside of this uh, sort of uh, four index uh, viscosity tensor, if you like. And by allowed terms, I mean everything that is allowed by the fact that I have SOD awarded entities because the underlying theory has rotational invariance. But we're doing a fluid expansion around a thermal state that actually breaks the SOD symmetry down to SOD minus one. In flat space, that is really simply because I have a vector in the game now. I cannot go to a rest frame, so there's always a vector somewhere. So the only symmetries are the symmetries that leave that vector invariant. So I have manifest SOD minus one uh, symmetry. So the building blocks are things that are invariant on the SOD minus one, and the water entities tell me that the energy momentum tensor, the space space part, has to be symmetric. And then I just have to write down everything that you can, you can think of. And if you do that in flat space, then essentially uh, the um, in Landau frame, uh, what you have to then classify are the this is essentially uh, the, the, the stress part and this is the momentum part. Uh, and you see that these are the derivatives that, that you can write down. And then for, for each of these derivatives, you have a different uh, sort of tensor of coefficients, uh, kappa and eta. Eta is a bit like viscosity, kappa is a bit like conductivity. Uh, and then you have to expand each of these tensors in terms of these uh, SOD minus one invariants. So which is the, the normalized velocity. So this, this is just the direction of the velocity and basically the orthogonal projection uh, in that way. And then you can, uh, you can do the counting and it turns out that there are 10 of these dissipative transport coefficients that have to obey all sorts of inequalities to ensure a positivity of entropy production. And then if you in, impose scale invariance like vicious scale invariance, then that is gets reduced from 10 to seven, essentially. Um, Right, so that, that is essentially uh, the whole analysis uh, for non boost event fluids up to first order in derivatives. Um, so um, um, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you something about this um, antisymmetric uh, viscosity tensor? So, um, um, well, I mean, yes, like, yeah, I mean, are you assuming like parity or something like that? And that the system is parity invariant? I don't, I don't understand why. I mean, if you don't have parity, I don't see why it should be zero. I mean, parity or time reversal. Why? Well, in general, it's not zero. zero. So, so, um, so I'm not assuming anything about parity. So, uh, so parity doesn't play a role in this analysis. It would no, be but you are I mean, in, the, in the, that slide you had before, it was written like if imposing no single relations, it was uh, fixing them to zero. I mean, it's just written in that. Uh, Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this statement I wrote here, which is the sort of the, the this, this statement that this uh, viscosity tensor is anti-symmetric if I switch the last two indices with the first two indices. That that is, if I write that as a matrix, that means that this is an anti. So, so in general, I have a matrix that has a symmetric and an anti-symmetric part. No, I understand uh, that. I, that's not what I'm asking. If you go back yeah. to the to to that uh, last uh, slide you were before, where you were showing the, the dissipative uh, part of the, of the tensor. Okay, yeah, here. Uh, here, so you're writing here that uh, linearized these are set to zero by the Osanger relation, the non-hydrostatic. So- Yeah, correct, yeah. That, that's the part that is confusing me because I don't, so this NHS, this NHS is the same tensor we were talking, you were showing me before, right? The, the one that is anti-symmetric. Yeah. Then my question correct. is why it has to be zero if you are not in assuming anything about parity? Because the Onsager relations are derived from assuming time reversal invariance. Okay, because you're so, assuming time reversal invariance. Correct, yeah. Okay. And so if you do that, then you can argue that at the linearized level, uh, the anti-symmetric no. part of theta has to vanish. No, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, if you are assume time reversal invariance, they are definitely, that's the case. But in general, they don't need to be zero. I, I agree with that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, okay. <laughs>
So, um, yeah, so I don't have time for any of this. I just want to wrap up uh, with some uh, summary. So it would be interesting to add a U1 current, uh, compute Kubo formulas, um, to think a little bit more about things like um, speed of sound. We have computed that in this paper, but that was always around uh, fluid at, at rest. That, was, that didn't have any velocity. Now you can, you can sort of make things a little bit more complicated and, and do it around fluids that have certain velocities. You can also ask the important question, like how do I measure any of these things? How would I experimentally ever be able to tell that a fluid doesn't have any boost symmetry? So certainly if you measure one of these transport coefficients, that would have to be zero in a relativistic case, but now all of a sudden they're non-zero. Of course, that will be a very clear sign that uh, boosts are broken. Um, it would be interesting also to find explicit examples where there is a hierarchy and boost and translation breaking, as I was alluding to in my introduction. Um, and then all the other comments were about the holographic side. So unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about that. But um, and yeah, I do I do apologize for going over time a little bit. But uh, thanks for for coming to my talk. Thanks a lot, Jelle. <laughs> so time for questions. Although we had already many questions, but please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 I have more questions. <laughs> yeah, please ask, please ask. Okay. Um, if you can go back, I think two slides back, there was this, uh, this dissipative uh, guys, this Kotsi, this, no, uh, yeah, many slides back here, that one. So uh, this is a time derivative in the couple of terms? Yes, yeah. Okay, so that's quite interesting because you say this is Landau frame. Yeah. Yeah, so usually in the relativistic uh, hydrodynamics, uh, when you impose lambda frame, then uh, one of the things why you do this is because precisely you kill this time derivatives. And, and that has in the relativistic case some consequences like, uh, well, one reason why you want to do this is that if you, if you look to linearized equations of motions, then you get first order uh, derivative in time only, right? Mm -hmm like diffusion equation. Exactly. Okay. But uh, for the relativistic case, that's bad because diffusion is are causal. So then you argue you have to add higher terms or, or so nowadays like Pavel, Pavel Kostum argues that uh, this lambda frame is sort of a singular frame and you should take mm -hmm. some other frame where you get, uh, then the equations of motion become uh, second order uh, in time and, and so morally speaking, you integrate in a second pole in the diffusion equation, make it into a telegraphers equation and that, and that is uh, causal. But here you seem to have something which you call lambda frame and you do have first order derivative. Uh, can you comment on this? Are the equations of motion now second order in time? And is there a frame in which they would be first order in time? So I think this is a consequence of the fact that I decided to eliminate all the temperature derivatives in favor of velocity derivatives. Uh -huh. So this acceleration term is essentially a temperature gradient. Uh, so if I use the linearized, if we just do everything linearized, then what I could do is I could replace the acceleration, the, so the, the time derivative of the velocity by spatial derivatives of the temperature. So in that sense, I could remove these terms. It's really a choice of uh, sort of what's the space of derivatives in which I'm doing this expansion. And we were motivated, our choice was motivated largely by uh, implementing a certain general strategy. And that, that was sort of the easiest way to do that was um, because it's, 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 it's much easier in a covariant sense to, to remove the temperature derivatives in favor of the velocity derivatives because of this equation I showed uh, in the beginning about, mm -hmm. you know, the lead derivative of tau can be written as the lead derivative of H uh, for the perfect fluid equations. But of course, we were not motivated by this sort of uh, questions about the like, sort of stability of the, of the derivative expansion, which is a very important question. So, Ultimately, you might want to do this in a different hydro frame when you start asking questions such as the questions that you're asking. So I'm not advocating that this is the right frame to sort of study uh, 
questions about sort of the stability of the system, that sort of thing. Yeah, Although we looked a little bit at linearized perturbations in an earlier paper, and we, everything was, I mean, it was, it was actually stable, but that was only for fluids, perturbations around fluids at zero velocity. Yeah. So I, you know, philosophically, there is, you know, hydrodynamics is supposed to, the way we view it, and I think the way you view it is um, sort of, um, um, it's a, how to say, local thermal equilibrium, which means that you can define some hypersurface. So here, a, really a, a surface at some constant time t, and then everything you have to specify in order to, to, to get the time evolution is the thermodynamic state on that slice. Mm -hmm. But that implicitly means that your equations of motions have to be first order, because you only want to know the temperature and the velocity. But you don't want to need to know the derivative of the velocity or the derivative of the temperature because these are already non thermodynamic variables. So, strictly mm -hmm. speaking, hydrodynamics, in this very restrictive sense, means that the equations of motion should not have second order derivatives in time. So, so you're essentially asking that there's a well posed initial value formulation of the equations of motion. And, yeah, and, in terms of in terms of uh, thermodynamic variables only. Correct, correct. Right? Yeah, and not derivatives of thermodynamic variables. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I agree with that uh, that that statement. And so, I think that um, these are probably not the right variables to do that. So, you probably then have to work with. Um, since it's an onshore expansion, you have to say which are the derivatives in which I'm doing yeah. that expansion. And I think that. Um, for that sort of questions, you probably have to replace some of these time derivatives of the velocity in, in favor of the spatial derivatives of the temperature, and you can actually do that. Okay, 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 thanks. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Yale. Hi. Can you say a quick few words about holography? So yeah, I can. Uh, I can. Uh, show you. I think we didn't hear Blaise's question, or was it only me? The question of that was can you say something about holography? Ah, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I can be brief. Uh, so so as you well know, there are two classes of broadly speaking, the two classes of holographic theories that have Einstein gravity in the bulk that allow for Lipschitz solutions. So you have the, the the, the massless gauge fields, so the EMD models, and you have the massive gauge fields, the EPD models. Now, in the EMD case, we have analytic solutions for the black holes, but they have a scalar field in the game. And um, in the EPD case, uh, the, you have only a massive vector field and a metric, and everything has uh, Lipschitz invariance, but we don't have these analytic solutions. And so, in so the question that arises is that, um, so, so what we were able to do is that um, essentially what you can do is uh, you can, so, so since there is no boost symmetry, if you want to do something like fluid gravity, you cannot just take a black brain and then boost it because that's not equivalent to a flat brain that is moving because you don't have the boost symmetry to make that claim. So you have to construct a new class of solutions of, of moving, we call them moving black brains that have a non-zero velocity. And so that's what we did here. So this ansatz here, we, here the brain is moving in the y direction. So we added these terms um, to the ansatz and then everything depends so on the radio. Yeah, really? I think we're not seeing your slides anymore. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you on the DC transport. You, you said here, but I don't think your slides are moving. Uh. No, no, I just, uh, just do the trick that I know works. Uh, sorry yeah. about that. Okay. Uh, that should be, yeah. So here's the ansatz for what we call a moving black brain. So it's moving in the y direction uh, because we have added these, uh, these terms here. And basically, ny is the, 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 the function that decides that on the horizon, evaluate on the horizon essentially the velocity of the, of, the, of the brain. So what you can do now is that you, you, see you cannot solve these equations analytically for all these functions here. Um, but you can solve it almost analytically. So you can solve it near the horizon, you can solve it near the boundary, and it turns out that this system of equations has some first integrals of motion, 
that are conserved along the radial direction. So you can then you can then relate. Um, so these these are these have to do with these scale symmetries. Um, if you write down an effective uh, action for for all these functions uh, in the ansatz, then that action has some scale symmetries, and associated with them, you have noted charges. And then these noted charges, uh, which are called Q1 and Q2, they can be evaluated on the horizon, uh, and they can be evaluated at the boundary. And this is essentially how you can derive the thermodynamics from it. And you can then deduce that uh, at the perfect fluid level, it is indeed of the kind that I showed in the beginning of my talk, that uh, it is one of these non boosting varying perfect fluids. But now the open problem is, can we now go to the next order in derivatives, even though I don't know the zero of order solution analytically, and I don't want to do the merits. And so that's, what to, I mean, you might think that that's not going to work. I'm not convinced it cannot work, but nobody has done it yet. So I think that's sort of the, the big open question. And, and the other open question is, uh, and probably you're from, from aware of that, is that the whole program of holographic renormalization in general, which you wouldn't have to do for this type of uh, space times, is still a bit of an open problem, I think. Uh, so it's it's not nearly it's, it's not at the stage where I can say you know given a Lagrangian that has a Z is three half Lipschitz black brain solution what are the precise counter terms I don't think that there is any such statement in the literature that is really at that level that you can say then this is the corresponding fathomogram expansion and in this fathomogram expansion this part of the energy momentum tensor sits here and that part sits there so that's also stuff that still needs to be worked out. But I think, yeah, so these are the two open problems here. But I think it's very interesting to pursue this more and sort of to learn more about these theories uh, and to see if there are any universal relations and to, to also ask the question, all these non-dissipative transport coefficients that we classify, do they actually occur in a holographic setting? What's their interpretation? You know, that sort of questions. I hope that answers the question, Bas. Yeah. I think Nils was saying something. Uh, no, oh, sorry, just the, that, that I couldn't see the right transparency. Ah, so, okay. <laughs> that was, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Go on, so, uh, in order, so here basically you have the sound mode that they have these uh, weird dispersion relations because you are breaking boost. What about uh, subdiffusion or super diffusion? Which kind of symmetry you should break to get a diffusive mode, which is not k square, but k to the something? Um, yeah, that, okay. I haven't thought about that uh, so far. We've only looked at the, the standard sound mode. So I, I don't but know. In, uh, in your setup, the diffusive mode is standard, right? It's just k square. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we analyzed those in an earlier paper uh, back in 2017. So uh, we did all the hydrodynamic modes, and uh, so all the diffusive modes are k squared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get your shear mode and uh, sound attenuation and all these things. Okay, thank you. Maybe if you break time reversal, because if I remember well, in weak field magnetohydro, there you have a, a sub diffusive mode. I see. So, like a square root k or something like that. Uh, okay, so k to the fourth. I don't know k how you call fourth. that. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's sub diffusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, that's within magnetohydro. So, I don't know if generally you look at a theory that breaks time reversal, then if this would always happen, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Any more questions or comments? Well, I have like small comments regarding the, existence, ahead, the holographic, I mean, the, the, the existence in holographic models of this uh, type of non dissipative uh, transport coefficients. Mm -hmm. I mean, like that, hologra that holographic model of, uh, of card with, um, for the vile semi metal. So the, the system has uh, this uh, whole viscosity, which is, and that system somehow sit in this uh, class of uh, 
system you're studying because I mean, in that case, there is some sort of like boost invariance, but it's a reduced, a reduced boost invariant because the system is like a three plus one. But, mm -hmm. the, but the Lorentz boost in that system is like a, a CO2,1. So mm -hmm. it has less, less uh, so I mean, the, the boost groups is, is, is smaller. And uh, yeah, in that case, there is a system. whole viscosity. There is a whole viscosity in that system. I see. Um, the point is that, in addition, that system has, a, and the rotational invariance is broken. But the point is that, uh, even yeah. though the system is in three plus one dimensions, I mean, the the boundary theory is in three plus one dimensions. The boost is uh, group is smaller because the Lorentz group is just a two comma one. So that's an example. Okay. Okay. That sounds interesting. Thanks. Any more questions? No one is. <laughs> okay, then let's let's thank Jelia again for a very nice talk. Yeah, thank and you yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just let me remind you two things. One, first is I will leave this open in case anyone wants to keep discussing. Uh, I will just switch off the recording and I will leave my computer on so the channel will be open. And second, for the youngest among us, there is this workshop coming up, Holotip Junior. So if you want to register, better register soon because we have lots of applicants, so we're very happy. And that said, uh, we, we'll be back in a week with Danny Bratton from Genova who will talk about uh, diffusion in a magnetic field. So thanks everybody. <laughs>